has a voice like no other. When we say a writer's voice, of course, we mean literally the sound that comes off the page, the literal music, the diction, the word choice, the quirks of speech, the pace, the rhythm, repetition, and pause, the dialogue that a character carries on with others and with his deepest self. Elegiac, yearning, complex, revelatory, and marvelously funny. That's how my students describe this voice. It's this inimitable quality that has enraptured readers and inspired the New York Times to praise the entertainment and vitality of Lee Abbott's prose. It's language as both lament and celebration, and it has won Lee Abbott a multitude of admirers. His books include Dreams of Distant Lives, Strangers in Paradise, Love is the Crooked Thing, The Heart Never Fits Its Wanting, Living After Midnight, Wet Places at Noon, and most recently, All Things All at Once, New and Selected Stories. Born in the Panama Canal Zone, Professor Abbott grew up in New Mexico, and that's where he is happily living now after having just retired as an emeritus distinguished professor at Ohio State University. The contemporary Southwest, with its golf courses and suburbs, is home to the lively, aching hearted men and women in his stories. They may be tied to their jobs and at war with their loved ones, but this beautiful starry desert with its howling coyotes is never far away, offering threat and solace to these talkative, flawed, impassioned characters at the heart of his stories. His fiction has appeared in Harper's, The Atlantic, Best American Short Stories, and the O. Henry Prize Stories a slew of times. He has twice won fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and was awarded a major artist fellowship from the Ohio Arts Council. He's the recipient of the Distinguished Teaching Award in Ohio State. And there's a dynamite interview that he just did that was just po published, posted on chapter 16, which is the a publication of Tennessee Humanity. So it's my sheer pleasure to welcome Lee Abbott. Thanks for coming out tonight. I know I'm competing with professional basketball after all. Just think of me as taller. <laughs> Um, I'm going to read a story called A Great Piece of Elephant. You'll discover soon enough that it's a joke. Because we're all here to enjoy ourselves. But it begins with some pretty grim material. Uh, for those of you who are writers in the house, you know, watch the tricks. My hands never leave my arms, but things happen. Even five years after he tried to kill himself on the Bureau of Land Management Bladed Road, just outside the gates to his brother's spread in the Capitan Mountains, almost within a stone's throw of the birthplace of the original Smoky Bear, LT couldn't figure out why. His life, he thought, had been dandy. Well, semi-dandy. Maybe dandy with an asterisk, which infernal punctuation led you to the finest of fine print where you learned, that about, you learned about the two ex-wives and the ribs he busted doing deep sea salvage out of Astoria, Oregon, and the four years playing softball for the Navy during Vietnam, and the bankrupt Baskin and Robbins 31 Flavors franchise, and yes, the booze, the lakes and oceans and rivers of booze, Oso Negro and vodka and Gordon's gin, early times and Miller and Coors and Robitussin and Listerine and Lordy, any grape or grain that might take one veil and turn it to another. But suicide seemed like a good idea at the time he told the first AA meeting he attended on Buckle Street in East Lubbock, where he now worked building cabinets and playing guitar and knocking the golf ball around on occasion while generally trying to keep his head screwed on straight. Sometimes, the blue times, the times when the modern world seemed to be missing a handful of its most precious parts. The times when he felt each of his 55 years falling away from him like old skin. He was tempted to quote one long gone comic on the crucifixion of Christ. Just one of those parties, he said, that got out of hand. Still, there had been one afternoon, the week before Christmas, 
His pickup stopped on the gravel track leading to into Smitty's place, not 60 paces from the house itself. Hell, not 55 from Smitty himself, who was sitting in his porch rocker, smoking. Much of high desert New Mexico, hither and yon, was snow covered, the light bending white and sharp and hard, sunset about a pony keg from noon. The truck's radio was on, heartbreak being served up and survived by those from the country western end of the Howling Cup. You had a girlfriend in his son, where you spent too many hours on too many of the wrong streets looking for him. You honored a God who loved you, warts and all, or you were a faithless pussy doomed to burn in the company of Peckerwoods and pointy-headed professors. Oh, it was a grand time to have arrived, he thought, as if by magic it seemed hole at a spot from which left and right for many and many a mile rose up hills dotted with juniper and pinon. And then LT pushed open the door, the truck still another thing he was indebted to Smitty for, it being wages for five months of hammering up a guest cottage out back by the pump house. Such seemed fair, he thought. A Ford F-150 as used as a dish rag with a camper top for the truck bed, given exchange given in exchange for six whack fingers and a saw cut the size of a nail file on his forearm. As well as Mormon's close cropped hair and kept the promise to avoid demon rum, even demons themselves, for a summer that had seemed to begin in late February the year before. So he was out, he tell the AA folks, standing tall, or tall enough for a fellow with a fifth of swills filling his belly and fox flying willy-nilly like pests big as boulders. He was getting himself square with Mother Earth, gravity just one phenomenon you could count on, not much between A and B but footsteps in English. The night before he'd been gambling at the Navajo Casino up near Rio Dosa, Kino mostly, with some blackjack to loosen the eyeballs. So his pockets were now miraculously stuffed with legal tender and quantities that made him feel like King Midas or Richie Rich made him feel, in fact, money as Smitty himself, the big-ass big brother who ran cattle and owned oil and gas properties in Chavez and Eddie counties, who was currently in the middle of his fourth consecutive term as a state senator from Lincoln County. And now, as LT made his way around the back of the truck, some of that money started floating out of his pockets, him a generous man showering an otherwise infertile landscape with seeds and sweetness which is when it occurred to him to say something. Serious gestures, after all, demanded serious talk. Hey, Smitty, he said, waving at the several of him sitting there. You sleep in those clothes, LT? He considered himself then, jeans a tad tight in the hindmost, cowboy boots even Roy Rogers would envy, a shirt that had all the appeal of sunrise itself. He, stirred, he turned to study his reflection in the truck cab, the fellow staring back at him at all the savoir faire of a rodeo clown. Vacation, LT mumbled, a lot of work in the word, had me a night. Smitty muttered something then, evidently perhaps, but LT found himself doing a jig with time. One moment made many, and he lost the what and where of himself before he re-engaged with the noun to discover his camper cap open above the tailgate, one hand rummaging in the toolbox before him. He was singing, too. Sweet Betsy from Pike. Hard scrabble Pike now missing its only Betsy. Mind if I borrow some garden hose, he said. He was holding up a utility knife. A plan, he told his first AA meeting after he got out of rehab at the VA hospital in Big Spring following his discharge from the state facility in New Mexico. A big plan, he said, with lots of contingencies and fallback. A plan to go to war with, say. A plan you needed Latin for, not to mention high-minded mathematics. A plan to put the heat back and to rub the darkness out of America. But Smitty was standing now, a brother of the spitting image of the old man, another cold-hearted, mealy-minded so-and-so, and LT's thought went went once again haywire, sends more non than not. Later, utility knife held aloft like Excalibur. He was surprised how quickly he had marched from his bumper to the hose coiled next to the garage. 
Now hold on, Smitty was saying, all but wagging the finger. I'm good for it, LT said. He yanked from his pocket another fistful of money, wadded it like a snowball. You just sit tight and I'll be done here in a jiffy. And soon enough he was, dragging the length of hose toward the truck. Where's Margo? He called over his shoulder. Smitty, believe it or don't, had a high water wife. Roswell, Smitty was saying, not much brotherhood in his tone, visiting her sister. LT took another step, a scary portion of the geography bleeding off into the massive dump at the horizon. How's your buddy the governor? This was palaver is all, talk without any teeth in it. Shooting the breeze with Smitty was like playing canasta with the hide of bed. I like that too. <laughs> Cruel, Smitty said. An outright goddamn communist wants to tax his granny's motorized wheelchair. Well, I voted for that son of a bitch, LT said, somewhat sure he was breaking the law by saying so. <coughs> you knucklehead, Smitty said. Come Christmas morning, he's putting $100 in every stocking in the land of the champ. This was talk so small, LT later said, that he needed tweezers and a preacher's patience to deal with it. So he vowed to keep his mouth shut as he rounded the truck and made for the driver's door. He felt wiry and pinched off, a puddle at the sunken center of him, and not a citizen worth rooting for. He was thinking about his first ex-wife, Lucy, now living happily ever after in Birmingham, Alabama, her life easily 28 years removed from his own, tight at the corners of choice as freedom. He'd called her last night from the casino, but he'd found when she came on the line that he had little to say, the very idea then was cockeyed as chickens that drive. Still, he said, hey, you got much the same in return with something about the long distance there after Spooky is gunplay. You're drunk, she said finally, which observation he tried to deny before admitting he was. Lucy always having to be an expert at working the truth out of him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang up now, he said, a second or two passing before he could work the rest of it. You were good to me, sweetheart. And then he'd return to the present moment, which was all about fitting one end of the hose into the exhaust pipe, which, it was turning out, was work as demanding as rocket science. On the ports, Smitty was lighting his pipe, still more evidence that the old man, the original Leonard Tip Smith himself, had risen out of the grave. And LT, his blood moving crosswise and grainy, was briefly tempted to run over there, if run he could, and smack his brother into the middle of next week. But all he did, his business with the tailpipe finished at last, was say, Democrats are sexy. <laughs> <laughs> to which Smitty, nose in the air as if sniffing out misrule itself, said, What? Bumper sticker, LT said. Saw it on a Cadillac over near Hondo in the highway. Smitty gave him a blank look, his lips straight as a ruler. You had to be there, I guess, LT said. Another sentence he was unspeakably proud to have left as his estate. So, that, so that's where LT quit, Smitty, these weary hours, the whole in and out of getting by and eased himself toward the driver's door again, downright goofy that his legs worked and that by all counts he was going to get to the end of this drama without passing out or puking most of yesterday into his lap. He was not sad, just fed the heck up. He shoved the other end of the hose through his window, rolled up the window to hold the hose in place, and yanked the door shut behind him. He snatched up his bottle of whiskey from the seat beside him and took a pull. It was nectar from the last tree in Eden. It was sweat at 16. It was the kissing booth at the county fair. It was elixir and ambrosia and fresh squeezed juice at breakfast. Through the passenger window, he noticed that Smitty had come down a, a step on the porch, shading his eyes against the terrible sun. LT saluted him with the bottle and cranked the ignition. He revved the V6 twice, the engine throaty and smooth, turned up the radio as far as his ears could stand. A minute, he figured, maybe two. No matter, he always told the AA people. He leaned back into the headrest, in the air something sweet and a touch tired. Democrats are sexy, he said to himself. He closed his eyes, only heaven to look forward to.
and the supersonic trip to get there. Cow. That's the word I was thinking when LT wobbled from the tailpipe to the door of his truck. And this too, lush. Plus, I was darn pleased that Daddy was not alive to observe what he would call behavior beneath contempt. And here's the last word I thought. Quit. No, I didn't imagine he'd go through with it. He'd never finished anything he'd started. Quit college, quit his football team in high school, quit his job at the Mays Lumber Yard, quit the music man he was in at the community theater. So I figured he'd sit for a minute or two, come to what few senses he had left, and heave himself into the road to clear his head. I watched, took note of the high sky, and puffed my pipe. Nothing whatsoever between me and my clean conscience. His creature parts, liver, and lungs, and stomach, and kidneys, and all the goo that binds them were in revolt. For decades they'd been fed poison after poison, and they'd had enough, more than enough. Anyway, when the radio burst on again, loud with the wails and moans of beasts and pain, I went indoors to call Marco. Guess who showed up? I asked her. Santa Claus, she said. Guess again, I told her, still watching LT's truck from the kitchen window. And it's not George Bush, either. Oh, Smitty, I don't have time for this horseplay. Libby and I are picking out nail polish. They have one here called Sinful. Me, I'm thinking French manicure, frosted tips, that sort of thing. I paused a moment here, reflected on the 36 years I'd been married to this sassy go-getter. LT, I said. He's killed himself. I could picture her at the other end of the line, lips pursed, brows knit, thinking I was pulling her still fetching leg. <laughs> Smitty, stop fooling with me. I told her then, the truck, the hose, the sad sack brother with the rain cloud between his ears, and me bearing stern witness. Look at me, he's saying. I'm, I'm madder, he's saying. It's pathetic, Margo. I'm embarrassed. He's a goddamn crybaby. Smitty, she said, stealing her voice. You call Mac now. I ain't going to bother him. He's probably busy. He's the sheriff, Smitty. Sheriffs are paid for busy. Outside, LT was working the dial to his radio, squawks and squeals descending upon him from outer space. Red, I told her, like Valentine's Day, like passion. What, she said? The fingernails, I told her, red like rubies and blood and certain sorts of underwear. You call Max, Minnie, or I will. LT was just angry, I told her, at me in particular, because I'd made something of myself, because of my checkbook. He's a dreamer, Margo, lives in a fairy world where bad is not supposed to happen. It's unbecoming, really. We shared considerable silence at that point. The air between us too icy for my likes. Okay, I said. I'll call Mac. For all the good it'll do, I'll call the Easter Bunny too. Man in the Moon, maybe. The New York Yankees. It won't matter, Margo. But she'd hung up. Her point made. And I did as I'd been told. Took Mac away from his lunch, I guess and stormed out to the truck to tell L.T. Smith, sapsucker, how offended I was. You're better than this, I told him. He was slumped in his seat, whiskey bottle between his thighs, mouth open, head turned toward the window I was speaking to. He needed a haircut and a shave, scarcely any difference between him and what you find under a bridge. I'm ashamed of you, L.T., you were raised better. One eye had popped open, unfocused, fish-like. You're a veteran, LT. Show some self-respect, some backbone. He rubbed his face then, too vigorously for my taste. And I could see a lot of our mother in him, another drunk, another biped for whom lived life was just one defeat after another, each day another day gone witch away with self-pity and anger. You'd think he'd know better or different. What is it you want, LT? Somebody to hold your hand? <clears throat> that open eye closed, slowly, and he bought, brought the bottle to his lips. The gulp he there, thereafter took big and noisy. Theater training, I thought. I want you to go away, he said. 
I told him to roll down his window some so I didn't have to yell, whereupon the window creaked down a few more inches and I got an eye-watering whiff of whatever was coming out of his tailpipe, a cross between burned toast and a firecracker. I want you to go back to your porch and leave me alone. In the distant west, you could hear a siren, Mac Brown, the sheriff, to the rescue. And a part of it, the meanest and driest and most pointed part, wanted to do exactly as LT had asked, just wheel on my heel, stroll to the porch, and settle myself to watch the rest of this story happen to someone else. You remember that dirt bike, LT asked? I looked at him hard, trying to find what we had in common. We looked no more alike than do dogs and deer. He was a stranger as all, who had sat on the other side of the Smith dinner table for 18 years. In the Arroyo, he said. The summer before LT's junior year in high school, I was working as our father's landman over in Lee County, where Daddy had spotted some promising parcels. It was my job to pay as little as possible for the gas and oil that lay under them. I've been married about a year to Margot, and we had a place small but comfortable on Birch Street. Early one evening, LP, LT appeared on our doorstep. I hitchhiked, he said. His bike had stalled in the Badlands, and he'd hoped to help him to haul it back to civilization. In those days, I was driving an International Harvester Scout, maybe big enough for the motorcycle, so we headed out. The Yamaha 250, I think that bike was, or Suzuki, possibly. To LT, silly as it sounds, it was girlfriend and God and red meat and breaking the finish line first. So we got to the Lyman's Road about five miles out of town and the thing wouldn't start. Crunch and cough was all. We tried to load it in the back of the scout, but it was heavier than we were strong and bigger than I'd expected. I told him to hide it in the weeds and salt cedars next to the arroyo yonder. Come on, Smitty, you whine. What if something happened? Nothing was going to happen, I told him. We'll come back tomorrow with a pickup and a ramp. That night, wouldn't you know it, we got a, got a gully washer. More rain in five hours than in five months. Rain of the sort you find in the Bible. Next door, of course, no motorcycle. No nothing. Not even a handlebar. Come to find out it had been washed into town piece by piece. And until LT walked into the station house on Richardson, the cops had been looking for the body of the rider. The LT showed up in my driveway with what he'd been able to salvage, the frame twisted like a pretzel, and the dinged up gas tank. Here's the expression you see on people at considerable odds with good fortune. What about it, I said to him now. He dug in his ear for a moment. More stage business to annoy the Dickens out of me. That's on you, brother. That motorcycle is on you. He had a twinkle in his eye. If you didn't know better, you'd think he'd had a week's winning lottery ticket in his pocket, plus a soiree to attend and tip up too. Suit yourself, LT, I said, the last words I wanted to be remembered by. You'd be right at this point to wonder why, on the path from truck to porch, I didn't stop to yank the hose out of the exhaust pipe. Here's the answer. Mac was coming, making good time, it sounded like. Also, LT hadn't sealed the hose in the pipe. Another half-assed job. More important, I figured this is a lesson learned, albeit the hard way. LT would get arrested, have his stomach pumped, spend a night in the drunk tank, and thus arrive, dried, dried out and humbled, at a new and lasting appreciation for the straight and blessedly narrow. So at the porch, I eased myself into my rocker, fished my pipe out of my pocket again. LT was singing now, some of the lyrics in Martian. Democrats weren't sexy, I was thinking. They were gas bags and sob sisters and several degrees of stupid. They had brains like junkyards and no inclination to clean up every now and then. Worst of all, one of those pea pickers was blocking my road. I get the call just as I'm finishing up lunch. The day to that point, just about as fine as change from a dog. I tell my wife Olivia that I have to go, got some commotion over at Smitty's place, and she gives me the eye. No fan at all of James K. Smith, Mr. Grand High Panjandle himself. He says his brother's committed suicide at the front gate, I tell him. 
LT, she says. He's difficult, all right. A minute later, I've alerted the EMT squad from Alta. Crew chief figures they can be over there in something under a half hour. Good time for a countryside where the road, don't, road doesn't go as the crow flies. I get on the radio, tell my dispatcher the situation, and goose the cruiser pretty hard down my road and over the cattle guard. I'm out to Smitty's place a good four or five times a year. Trespassers, hunters in the same zip code, a dishwasher, a busted air conditioner less left by the industrial trash compactor outside old Lincoln Town. Piddly matters, to be sure, but well nigh life and death to the Senate. More proof, he claims, of the hell we're hurrying toward. He always invites me in for coffee and a pastry he's baked. We chew the fat, and sometime thereafter, I'm on, I'm on my way, advised to keep an eye out for the felons and illegals and shifty sorts that America's too soft on. LT, on the other hand, I only see him irregularly at the county fair, say, or at the VFW in Carrizozo, or maybe Mr. Brewer's shell station. He's got an apartment in Capitan, and he cowboys for the GBRF spread out toward Nogal. Last time I saw him, he was across the street from the high school, protesting creationism in the free flu shot program. We talked, me and the cruiser, him walking from crosswalk to stop sign, and he said his best to Miss Eludia, then turned around and began singing, We Shall Overcome which is how you get, I'm guessing, when life deals you only jokers or the old maid. Olivia says he's a big dog that can't get enough to eat. Anyway, Licky Split, I get to Smitty's, park some distance behind the truck. Smitty's on the porch, pipe in hand, something like delight in his face. Procedure says to watch your backside in a circumstance like this. Now it's a prevention and all that. So I punched the siren, burp more or less, to get LT's attention, if there's any left to get. Nothing. Just the rumble of the truck, oily smoke squirting out of the tailpipe. How long has he been in there? I hollered to Smitty. Not long enough, he hollers back. He keeps rolling down the window to, window to spit. Let him stew a while. I climb out of the cruiser then having a fair idea that I have no idea what I'm in the blasted middle of. Know this about yours truly. Instead of a domestic call, give me a piss ant with a handgun and a foul attitude any day. Hey, LT, I call. You got a minute? More of nothing. Just yardage and the creepy knowledge that I have to go one place before I can go another. He's going to be mad, Mac. That's what he does. He throws a tantrum. I'm moving toward the truck now, approaching from an angle so I can see LT's door. I don't want to surprise him, have him do something dumb, though at the moment I'm not sure what the devil dumb is. I guess it's trying to sort out in five minutes what got mixed up in five million. He's got a knife, Matt, what he was saying, he butchered my hose. The training manual tells you how to enter a house, how to secure your weapon, how to walk the talk. But nowhere in it does it tell you what to say to six feet of asshole wearing a Stetson. <laughs> nowhere in it will you find explanations for heartlessness or idiocy. I see the hose in question still dangling from the exhaust pipe. What's the matter with you, I ask Mr. James Smith, public servant. I had my reasons, he says, nothing in his voice to suggest that those shouldn't be my reasons, too. I snatch the hose out of the pipe. Go in the house, Senator, I say. Go in or I'll arrest you right now for aiding and abetting or depraved indifference or God knows what. This is a police matter. He rises from his rocker, gives one leg a shake. I have to use the facilities anywhere, sir. Have a nice day. He takes his sweet time, and I'm certain that he and I will never again share an apple fritter across his kitchen table. At LT's window, I see he's twisted pretty uncomfortably, it looks like, toward the passenger side. <clears throat> Lantern, I tap the window with a knuckle. I've seen the dead before. Car wrecks, old timers in their beds, ranchers kicked into the next world by a steer or a mule, those swept away by flood, a tourist lit up by a forest fire. But until this instant, I've not seen a suicide. Pure happenstance, I reckon. LT is gray-faced, his lips pasty, 
something about the tilt of his chin suggesting an inner life made of wire and bark and dust. And I am stuck, struck by how skinny he is, all bones and store-bought dry goods. I open the door, reach over to turn off the ignition. I feel for a pulse on his neck, but my hand is shaking like a schoolboy's. The inside of the truck smells moldy and old, like what's in a box in the back of your closet. Plus, he's got what looks like a year of litter in there. Empty cigarette packs, five or six inches of newspapers, a sleeve of Little Debbie cupcakes, a pricey looking pair of ladies' high heels, the Albuquerque yellow pages, and one bat of R36 pink insulation. Worldly goods, St. Peter might say. Tell him to stop. It's LT and he's presented me with one veiny eyeball to concentrate on. You hear it, he says. I'm breathing again, my heart more or less where it belongs. I can't tell if he's talking to me or to a phantom from dreamland. Tell him to knock it off, okay, LT says. I got a doozy of a headache. <coughs> I ask him, who? Nothing to hear hereabouts, but whatever it is, the wind whispers. Shit, Mac, he says, the guy banging on the sheet metal. People are sleeping here. I need a good minute or so to hoist him out of the cab. Little about him working as it should. He's a big dog, all right, mostly dead weight. And I'm a guy whose idea of physical fitness is throwing horseshoes on the 4th of July. You gave me a scare, LT. He says, sorry. The word with a remarkable number of syllables to it. I'm getting married, Mac, I tell you that. He didn't, I said. I have him propped up against a boulder across the drive from the vehicle and I'm praying he doesn't irk on himself or pee his pants. Met her last night at the Billy the Kid Casino. She's a pit boss, a real firecracker. That's good, LT. I'm really happy for you. He gives me a second eye then, as if I'm a species he hasn't seen before. Her name is Rita, I think. I crouch in front of him, give him a thorough once-over. Olivia says I have a good roadside manner, her notion of a joke. She says I should have been a coach or a head shrinker because I give a hoot, a hoot about our kind. That's true. I hate to see us humiliate ourselves. I'm saddened by the bottom we reach and what we're sometimes content to live with. We're a better tribe, I say. And I say that to myself, even though I've spent most of my adult life too often in the company of folks holding the ugly end of the stick. I'm in trouble, aren't I, LT asks. This is the voice of a boy caught writing naughty words in the schoolhouse wall. I'm afraid so, I tell him. Then I give him the drill. He'll go to the emergency room in Rio Doso so they can flush him out, sober him up. Then because the statutes work as they do, he'll spend time in the holding cell in the county jail while arrangements are made to ship him to the state hospital in Las Vegas for observation, maybe some treatment. That's where the old man sent my mother when I was a kid. She liked it, she said. They treated her with LSD. <coughs> the mother, the lame she was, always wearing hats that were as much state of mind as headgear, had passed some years ago. She seemed pieced together by an evil genius, a creature brought to life by pride and rage, elements awfully common here on planet Earth. Yeah, but she was a drunk too, LT is telling me, so you couldn't believe a damn word she said. We're at the end of it, I'm thinking. The same end we always come to. Life's a series of ends. For LT, today is just another yesterday, as was the day before that, the day before that. For yours truly as well. For all sentimentalists, sir. I'm cold, Mac. I hand him my jacket and advise him he better not spit up on it. Olivia hates it when I come home smelling like a job, I tell her. Don't worry. This is the smile he must have given Rita last night. White as new snow itself and easily 200 volts of Heidi Ho. I figured the ambulance will be here in five minutes, tops. I figure too that Smitty is probably at a window watching and arranging his grievances in rank order, past to present, small to big. Me, I'm gazing down the valley, the light a glaze shiny as new paint, hours of nature more right than wrong. Oddly, a song, a song has sprung to mind. She'll be coming around the mountain. And I presume to know exactly which mountain she'll be coming around. 
She'll be wearing, wearing red pajamas when she comes. She'll be driving her six by horses and waving like crazy, tickled all sorts of silly and pink to have that wretched mouth behind her. Democrats are sexy, LT said. I study and I'm hopeful the talk has turned to a topic I can understand. Bumper sticker, he says. Go on, I tell him. He looks left and right as if he's about to tell me a secret he discovered when he was in short pants. Big print, he says. Democrats are sexy. Big print, I think. Just what we need more of. Little print underneath, he says. Who ever heard of a great piece of elephant? <laughs> I'm wrong. It's the little print we need to attend to. That's funny, isn't it, Matt? Yes, I say, it really is. Thank you all. <laughs> Happy to take a question or two if you have something on your mind. Sir. Uh, great question. The story is built around two facts. My brother did have a motorcycle that broke down in the desert and was washed into town in pieces. He was disappointed. <laughs> and we, did, we had gone out in, in this scout island to try to get the thing on. Couldn't do it. The second thing is that he did actually try to commit suicide in my drive. Uh, we weren't there. We were in Ohio at the time. I heard, all about, all, I heard about this all second hand. So it's built around those two things. I wasn't there. I don't, I don't see myself as quite the SOB at Smith. Smith. I'm, I'm an SOB to be sure, but uh, <laughs> not that part of it. So it's built around those two things. And the, and the, the things I say about the character that, that is the drunk here I the, only, the only detail that has any factual basis whatsoever is that my brother is a Navy veteran and did serve in Vietnam. And he is an alcoholic. Now sober for 12 years. So it's out of those kinds of little details that you know one makes a story. So, for better or not. My wife once said to me, if I see another one of my body parts, <laughs> she had she was a horsewoman when we met. She was a and she had fallen off one of her horses and split her cossacks with the bone. And so she had this cute kind of <laughs> <laughs> Simply why thing in her ass. But I stole that from the star. Yeah, she put a foot on Um You know, I I used to tell myself, good of course, that I wasn't responsible for the world, I was just sort of responsible for accurate reportage about it. Um, but I remember one time I had a scene in a story in which a a young man and a young woman were uh, having dry humping <laughs> on a couch. And uh, I was using the name of a girlfriend I had in high school just to help me focus. <laughs> <laughs> and I forgot to change it when the story was published. And I heard from Patricia later on. <laughs> she sent me a very nice note back in the days when you actually sent notes to folks, right? Saying she couldn't make up her mind whether to send me send a hitman after me or a strip of man. <laughs> so you know, I, I like to think that I use my imagination to transform the details that are the facts of my life in, into a life that makes a whole lot more sense between margins than it does uh, between. Uh, Waking this evening. I hope this helps. Sir. What is the message of your story? The message? Yeah, what would you like, what would you like uh, us as the audience to gather? 
Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't have messages. You know, what's what Samuel Goldman say? Was it Samuel Goldman? If you want to send a message, hire Western Union. <laughs> you know? I just uh, write stories. I think in which I hope that you sort of connect with your own humanity again. You know, find out what it's like to feel. It's my job to manipulate you that way. So you know, I've got nothing to say. There's, there's nothing I can tell you. Hold it. There's, there's nothing I can tell you at 24 that you didn't already know is true at 12. There's, there's nothing I can add to that. What I can do is, is uh, help you have experiences that are maybe alien to those that you've had to this point. Yeah. You mentioned in this interview that you use a lot of material in a story, and yeah. that shows how much is packed in there. And I know that some writers collect certain things. They might collect little bits of language, or they might collect, uh, oh, headlines, tabloid stuff to use in stories. Is there anything in particular that you collect? Names. I think there's a lot. Names can do a lot of work. I, I would hold. I would argue that there's a difference between a Susie, a Sue, a Susan, and a Susan. Those are four different people. And some people get very fussy about that kind of stuff. I also collect, uh, well, turns of phrase, of course. Everybody knows that. I collect titles. In fact, I've come up with the title for my new book. I've tried it out. I've tried it out on everybody, so you guys will finally help me decide. It's called, uh, Yes, Please, Thank You, No. Isn't that just nonsense enough to be useful? <laughs> <laughs> it's also, I, mean, I, I don't keep a, a journal or anything. I keep a diary from a uh, calendar. And I write these things down. You'd be surprised how little of that actually makes it into fiction. But it's, a, it's I guess in some circles they call it kind of pre-writing. It, it helps me think, however, without any particular focus on stuff that maybe I hope comes into sharper relief as time goes on. It's fun. It's fun. It's all of us. One more maybe and then we'll go to the bar? <laughs> Sir? How long have you been writing? Well, I, I retold Sir Gawain and the Green Knight in the 11th grade <laughs> and my teacher let me read it to the class. So at least the 11th grade, but probably before that, reading stories. I had the great good fortune of growing up uh, having a terrible childhood, <laughs> which forced me to entertain myself. And so you know, reading was essential to all of that. <clears throat> and then I discovered, well, you know, these things are just made out of words. Maybe I could put a few words together too and do to strangers what had been done so successfully to me. So, you know, I wrote Blackbeard the Pirate stories in 56 Street. It's a long time, long time. Okay, thanks folks, thanks. <laughs>